Hello. Uh, as Andrew said, my name's uh, Rob Emanuel, and I'm the I'm a software developer at Xavier, the tech lead of GeoTrellis. Uh, GeoTrellis is a Scala library for doing geospatial processing and just all things geospatial. Um, and I'll get a little bit into that later, but I'm gonna, what I'm here to talk about today is uh, distributed tile processing with GeoTrellis and Spark. Um, and I'm going to begin with just describing the challenge uh, that we've been facing at Azavia, and I feel like a lot of uh, geospatial programmers have been facing, um, which is how do we work with very large raster data? And I say very large raster data in that, like, you couldn't fit the data into one computer's memory. So that, that sort of size. Or if you could maybe fit chunks of uh, the raster data in uh, memory at a time and work with it one at a time, so we take like a tile and work with the tile, uh, it would be very slow, it would take a week to process and you'd just quit and go home. So just really, really large data. Uh, so to put sort of a face on that sort of data, I'm gonna describe a couple data sets that we at Azavia are working with. Um, that's a broken link, that's good. Oh, there we go. Um, so one such data set is called the National Land Cover Data Set. The National Land Cover Data Set describes the usage or the classification of different areas of land in uh, the United States. So it covers the entire uh, contiguous, continent, uh, U.S. Uh, at 30 meter resolution and it's derived from Landsat data, which is uh, satellite remote sensing data archived by the United States Geological Society. And it classifies land into 20 categories, such as developed high intensity, so like a, a city building would be um, uh, high intensity developed land, or evergreen forest. It doesn't even just say these are trees. It says, you know, specifically like this is this type of forest. So it's really, really useful data. And one use that you might um, have for this data is to say, okay, we want to plant new trees. Where could we do that? And actually at Azavia, we develop a program called uh, Open Tree Map, which is open source and also hosted. And um, it allows you to map trees. Philadelphia has a running instance of Open Tree Map, uh, and I encourage you to go and map our trees, please, because uh, that's a great thing to do. But we also want functionality to say, if we we're gonna if we we're gonna plant new trees, where where would we want to do that? And sort of the the baseline start of trying to figure that out is where can't we plant trees? So where is the open water? Where are the uh, city buildings? Where's the highly developed land that we can't actually have trees? Uh, and so the National Land Cover data set can can talk about that. Um, and it, like I said, it covers the whole nation. So the raster that we're working with is like 150,000 columns by 100,000 col uh, rows, and uncompressed is approximately 134 gigabytes. So it's a big, big data set, and usually you'd be working with just a subset of this data set, so you could use something like Google to cut out a portion of it and then work with you know, the Philadelphia uh, land cover. But an uh, application like OpenTreeMap wants to be available for the entire United States, so if we have multiple open tree map users that want to take advantage of this data set, we might be getting requests for the national land cover data set from California and Philadelphia and the south and, and everywhere all at once. So we need this uh, data set to be highly available. And that's, that's a challenge. That's a, definitely a challenge of working with this uh, large of a data set. Another data set that we're working with at Azavia is something called global circulation models. And this is model output data for predicting uh, world temperature and precipitation out to uh, 2099. And uh, the global circulation models are sort of governed by this um, committee called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And they publish a report roughly every seven years that sort of goes through the current landscape of climate data and climate models and uh, does sort of a curation process and a scientific like peer review process to say what models are, are, are valid and sort of what is uh, the current cutting edge of climate uh, prediction. And the most recent report um, was published in 2014 and more than 
800 authors worldwide were involved in writing this. So this is like really important data because climate change is, you know, most of us know it's like a really important topic. And it really takes this abstract concept of climate change and puts hard data to it. It's, it's predictive data, but it's the best guesses by the smartest minds the world has to work on this problem right now. And so, so we want to be able to actually like make decisions based off this data, uh, you know, analyze it. So let's take a look at you know, how much data we're talking about. Uh, the current report has 21 models, describes 21 models. Uh, there's four carbon emission scenarios. And a carbon emission scenario is like uh, trying to predict, uh, you know, a, a situation where the human race sees its carbon emission and says, okay, we're doing bad things. We need to stop putting CO2 into the air. So what happens if, uh, you know, what would the climate look like if that happened versus um, the, the worst carbon emission scenario where we're just like, we don't care. We're just going to pump CO2 into the air. We're going to keep doing that. So the climate model predicts different things for these different scenarios. And there's four different measurements that it gives. It gives the temperature max, uh, mean, and min, and precipitation. And we want to be working with daily model output from uh, 2005 to 2099, which is a lot of days. So it's about 11 million combinations. And if we want a raster for each one of those combinations, uh, say we had like a thousand by thousand raster, which is not very resolute for the, to cover the whole entire world. That's 64 terabytes of data. And that's pretty, that's pretty big. I mean, if we want to ask questions like, how do we take the average of a series of models and then calculate, say, the uh, number of years between 1920 and 1950 that have uh, a temperature over 99 degrees? It's like a question that m might be useful to some people analyzing the you know, climate situation, but it's a very hard question to ask that much data. So here's some of the uh, tools that we've been employing at Azavia to work with this uh, sort of data. And one such framework is called Spark. And Spark is a, it's a cluster, um, it's a clustering platform. It's a fast and general engine for doing large scale data processing. It's pretty highly used in um, uh, machine learning uh, situations, a lot of different uh, marketing um, applications. Uh, but not really yet applied uh, to the geospatial domain. And it does things that Hadoop doesn't, like cache intermediate results in memory. And I don't want to get too technical with this talk, uh, but if you know what that means, then you, it, and if you know about Hadoop and haven't really heard it, looked into Spark, I highly recommend looking into Spark. Uh, to me, it represents the next generation of MapReduce frameworks. And it's also written in Scala, which I really like because uh, I work on a project called GeoTrellis. And GeoTrellis is a Scala library for doing all things geospatial. It's a framework for doing uh, distributed raster processing. Uh, we've spent a couple years doing distributed raster processing on a platform called Akka. Uh, now we're working very hard to uh, add geospatial capability to Spark. And it's currently in incubation at Loca Location Tech. Another technology we are using is uh, Accumulo which is a distributed data store. It's a uh, big table implementation, so Google's big table. Uh, it's an uh, open source implementation of that. Has sorted indexing, uh, columnar database, and uh, it's also used by GeoMesa, which is another Scala project at Location Tech. So we're excited about the, uh, the synergy that's happening there. So what, we, what can we already do with GeoTrellis and Spark? This is currently under development. So some of the things that we're, we've been working on, <coughs> we can work with spatial only or time series rasters. So uh, a spatial raster it, like the uh, NLCD is one where it doesn't really have a time element. It just says, okay, here's the, here's the, here's the high resolution raster of the entire uh, United States and here's the classification. Uh, whereas the climate data is time series rasters, which is here's a series of rasters that represent slices at different times. So, uh, we've been able to work generically with uh, just both uh, only spatial key component and uh, spatial and temporal key component keys with these rasters. Um, we're able to ingest raster data with an index tile scheme into a Cumulo or HDFS. Uh, 
uh, serve out tiles out of HDFS or Accumulo with fast, en uh, fast enough for a TMS web services so we can paint these tiles onto maps out of these giant data sets. Uh, and also we get to take advantage of all of the uh, operations that GeoCharles provides um, on Spark. So currently we have local operations and zonal summaries uh, implemented for raster data. So I'm gonna pray to the demo gods and see, see if this works. Try to show you some of this uh, data that I'm talking about. So this is the national land cover data set. Uh, this is the whole thing. I'm running this on a EC2 cluster of 12 nodes uh, that's in Accumulo. I've ingested the, the raster and um, pyramided the zoom levels to each of the zoom levels that match up with the TMS tiling scheme. So I can zoom in and you can see, hopefully the internet is nice to me. And we can see that the resolution kind of zooms in. So this is the entire nation's data set, and I can get pretty close. The, uh, the native resolution is about, let's see how far I get. About here, right? And so this is, this is serving out tiles for, for this, uh, this whole data set at a pretty, pretty fast rate. So I don't know how, I'm pr how impressed you are by this, uh, but I'm pretty impressed. It's, it's really nice to get to see a whole national level data set be served out um, as tiles, and I can just scroll through the entire, I'm not gonna ma make you sit here and watch this, but I can scroll through, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna sit here and scroll through the entire United States, and we can see all of the different uh, land cover data for this whole data set. It's pretty cool. Um, here's another, data set that I was talking about. This is the, uh, the temperature max um, for a specific model, this GISS-ER-EQ-R climate model. Um, and this is off the screen, but this is all of the, uh, this, is, this is a monthly data set out to 2099. But these, these actually serve a little bit slower because we're still working on optimizing the, the uh, Spatial temporal time indexing scheme in Accumulo. Um, oops, and also I have to press the button. There we go. So we can see that, let's see, this is uh, 2095 in May, and uh, we see that there's like a really high temperature in Sub Saharan Africa. Let's see if we can see any difference and just poke around and look at May of 2008, which is actually historical data. All right, a little less. So we, we proved climate change, I guess. Um, <laughs> but this, this, is, this is pretty cool because it lets, me, it lets me take this esoteric data set that's like this climate model data and it exists in this, this format called NetCDF. And it, if you're not a climatologist, you really don't know, like it's, it's really tough to like read uh, data out of it. You have to use Google to like, slice it up in a specific way and you have to know all the metadata tags. And so if you wanted to just compare that, you know, May of far in the future to May of 2008, um, that's something that you're gonna need, like, need a degree to do. But with these tools, we actually sort of liberate the data. We say, okay, it's, it's here in a ingestible form that somebody like me can just play around with and like, you know, compare different, different seasons to. Um, and I think that's really the point of what we're trying to do. We're trying to take this, this data that's sort of like locked into these file formats and make it, um, make it readable by you know, somebody that has a browser that can point to this web service. And this is just the beginning. We're just painting it on a map here, which lets me play around with it. Is it basically this, this whole data set is at my fingertips at this point, but if, it's at my fingertips just as, at a web browser. If I allow it to be at, at the fingertips of a, of a machine that can start to do complex analysis of this, of this data, and we can start write algorithms that like actually tell us a lot more about the data, um, you know, we, can make, we can make a lot more uh, discoveries and uh, enable a lot of decision making about um, you know, 
how to how to plan for regions uh, based on climate data and how to plant trees. So that's about it for me. Thank you.